Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, there's so many things today that can pull us away from you and from your love. The culture around us, the things that just don't seem to mesh with who we are as followers of Jesus. Lord, help us from going apostate, from turning away completely and following the way of the culture. Help us to stick close to you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, now in this message series, we're in week three. We're looking at letters from Jesus to the seven ancient churches that are mentioned in Revelation chapter two and three. The point is, what do these ancient letters to God's people of old say to us as his followers today? So this morning, we're going to look to the church in Pergamum. It's a little hard to see, but it's the one at the very top in Galatia, there in Asia Minor. A little background on Pergamum. It was a very affluent city, built high on the top of a mountain. There was this beautiful theater there that looked out over the valley below, and you could see for miles from there. Now, the rich people in town lived on top of the hill. The poor people lived on the bottom. All the fun stuff in Pergamum, happened on top of the hill. There was a huge temple there to the Greek god Zeus. And like I mentioned last week, there was also an altar to the Roman Emperor Domitian, who declared himself to be God, basically Jesus reincarnate, while he was still alive. There were brothels, prostitution, all other kinds of evil things that were happening on top of the hill. Now on the bottom of the hill, you could very easily find black magic, you could find sorcery. Poor people were being taken advantage of regularly. So Pergamum was a powerful but evil and immoral city. If you would have visited it back in around 80, 70, 80 or 90 or so, you would have walked into town and just sensed something here isn't right. The followers of Jesus in Pergamum faced a very tough question. How in the world do we deal with this? Which way do we go? And really, that's the same question you and I face today as followers of Jesus. Our culture has moved, had a great talk about this in Bible class this morning, from a Christian culture to a post-Christian culture, or I would even say a pre-Christian culture that's looking for answers in a really wacky world that can be found in Jesus. So how do we as followers of Jesus today respond and live in a culture that clearly is no longer for us? Many in Pergamon decided it's a lot easier just to go along with the culture. They ended up being apostate, followers of Jesus in name only. Now, on the outside, they may have looked good. They may have said, well, I'm a Christian. But if you dug deeper to the inside, they had gone the way of the culture. And that, folks, is a challenge for us today, too. Now, Jesus had a few good things that he said to that church. In verse 13, he said, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. There's a challenge right there. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Jesus' followers were under attack in, the, in that community. Satan's hands were in everything, but there were a few that held on. As was the case in Ephesus two weeks ago, there were over 50 recognized false gods in Pergamum. So just imagine one day if you stood up and you said, Jesus is the only real God, immediately you'd be attacked. 50 other so-called religious groups would be furious with you. Under the Roman Emperor Domitian, to be a Christian was actually punishable by death. Antipas, who was mentioned in the reading, was one of the first martyrs he died for his faith. We look in ancient history and we see that he was actually boiled to death in a brass pot. What a way to go! 
My goodness. But Jesus said, look to Antipas for an example of an enduring faith in the midst of those challenges. There were some who held on. Now, Jesus had a few complaints against them, and this all fits together with us today. Verse 14, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you that hold to the teaching of Balaam. I'll explain this in a moment. Who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Okay, what's that have to do with us? I'm getting there. Balaam, you might remember, is from the Old Testament book of Numbers. This is one of those Sunday school lessons that was kind of interesting. Remember, God spoke to him through his donkey on the road. Go to King Balaam and speak seven oracles, messages from God to him. He's not going to like what he hears because he is the enemy of Israel and he wants Balaam to curse them. But instead, Israel would be blessed. Balaam wanted the money that King Balak would give him for cursing Israel. But when it came time to speak, he could only speak the truth that God had given him. Now, after sharing these oracles, Balaam still wanted to be on King Balak's good side. He wanted the money. So he tell, told uh, Balak, hey, here's what you can do. Israel has a weakness, sexual immorality. So bring in a bunch of Canaanite women. They intermarried, and things went south in a hurry. That is a little example of what was happening in the church in Pergamum. They were no longer influencing the culture. Instead, the culture was influencing them. Jesus rebuked them for becoming apostate. What does that mean? Apostate means knowing what is right, but still choosing to do wrong. Okay. It's like saying to a child, okay, Johnny, here's what I want you to do. The child smiles back at you and then immediately goes and does the very opposite thing. How often do we do that as grown-ups? We understand what God's Word wants us to do. But we say, oh, I don't like this. I'm going to do my own thing. You see, there's some dangers we can learn from this text as God's people today. What's shaping your life? Is it the culture around us? Is it Jesus? As our culture continues its slide away from Jesus, it's becoming more and more difficult for us to remain faithful. We are berated. All the messages that we get are countercultural to what Jesus tells us. It's pretty obvious. In Romans 12, verse 2, Paul writes, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If it's our goal simply to fit into the culture around us, we are kind of on a dangerous path towards apostasy. Are we compromising our teachings about God? In ancient Pergamum, they did not agree with everything Christianity taught, so they brought in other teachers and they paid them well. These false teachers shared what their itching ears wanted to hear. Have you ever heard something from the Bible and thought to yourself, boy, I don't like that, thumbs down. That's hard. That makes me uncomfortable. The temptation is to say, eh, just ignore it. I'm going my own way. Many people in our world today think the most important thing in the world is how they feel about something. Look, I know this is what God teaches, but I'm doing my own thing. Folks, that is a dangerous and very challenging road to walk. So with that in mind, Jesus says to his people, the church in Pergamum, and to us, a word that's often a hard one to hear, it's repent. Now sometimes we hear that word repent and go, oh, wait a minute. I don't like that word at all. Repentance means admitting I did something wrong. But hear me out. Repentance is also an invitation to something better. To repent literally means to turn away from something and 
to something else. Jesus invites the church at Pergamum and each of us to turn our lives back to him and to his unconditional love. Repentance is a daily thing for a follower of Jesus because we constantly fall into the traps, the muck of the world around us. And then it gets a little tricky. Verse 16, Jesus talks about a sword. He says, repent therefore, otherwise I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. What? Well, what's this all about? Jesus speaks truth out of the words of the sword of his mouth. He invites that church and all of us to follow him. Whose team are you on? Who do you trust? Do you trust the world out there? Or do you trust the Lord enough to say, you alone are God. I will follow your ways even when they're hard, even when I don't always understand them or like them. And in love, he calls us to turn back to him. And then he promises us several fabulous things in verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden men. I'm coming back to this. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. There's a lot of... Kind of strange stuff there. He's saying, listen to what I have to say, and here's some great promises. First, he says, I'll give you some of that hidden manna in heaven. Think back to Exodus. When God's people of old had wandered through the wilderness, the Lord provided manna, bread from above. It literally means, what is it, to sustain them. Jesus is saying that he knows how hard it is to live in this world. He gets it. But he says, I will sustain you with life-giving manna. Matthew 28, 20. Surely I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. When times get difficult, we just don't understand why these things are happening and people press in against you. Jesus says, I'm going to be right there to sustain you. Every step the journey. Turn from the world, turn toward me. And then in verse 17, he mentions this white stone. What is that all about? The buildings in ancient Pergamum were all built from black stone. Jesus says, I'm going to help you stand out for all the right reasons. Not because you have the right answers. Not because you think it might be your job to judge everyone else. Not at all. I'm going to show you what it means to be church in a world where people may not understand you. Or they may not even like what you have to say. Or they think you're totally nuts. Instead, there's something that's different about you that makes you stand out. We want to be like that. You will stand out for all the right reasons. In a time where the church as a whole often stands out for all the wrong reasons, you and Christ our Redeemer have stood out for all the right reasons. You get what it means to be church, God's hands and feet in our world today. I will give you a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Now, some people think, this is part of it, that that new name is the new life that we've been given in Jesus Christ. Once we were dead, now we're alive. Uh, the old is gone, the new has come. In fact, in some cultures, and you'll see this a lot in Africa, when you are baptized, you are at that time given a new Christian name to show that you have been given a new identity in Jesus. I think Jesus is going even a step beyond that here. Think back to when you first started dating your significant other, or maybe even all the way back to that first boyfriend or girlfriend in middle school or high school. I won't go into elementary with that. I'm guessing the two of you had nicknames for each other. 
And here's the thing about those nicknames. No one else understands. Just the two of you know what that means. I see a bunch of you looking at each other right now. Jesus says that you are going to understand what it means to be in an intimate relationship with God himself through Jesus. Jesus, the one who gave his life on the cross and who rose from the dead for you, says, I want you to know what it means to walk with God, the creator of the universe, in a relationship that offers you so much more than anything you would ever find on this earth that the false teachers and immoral lifestyles could ever offer you. Jesus is offering himself to you and to me. Because there is where you find real life and real joy. Not in the stuff of this world or in the culture. He says it's in him. Peter, John 6, verse 68 says, well, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So today, as church, God's people, Jesus invites us to have hearts that are humble, repentant, that follow him, and that are shaped and formed by him, not by the world around us. Here's the best part of it. Yeah, we're, we're going to fail at that time and time again. But in those moments, he lifts us up. He reminds us that he loves us in spite of the mess that we can be. He calls for us to return and to find real life in him, the resurrected the living Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus.